Yorgos Faraklas is a philosopher from Greece. He teaches political philosophy at the University of Pantheon in Athens. Uh, he studied in France and completed his PhD under the direction of Bernard Bourgeois on the topic of individual in Hegel's political thought. Uh, he's author of many books on Hegel and political philosophy in general. Uh, and tonight's lecture is on Hannah Arendt. More precisely, the title is Politics after Kronstadt, Hannah Arendt on Councils and Society. Yorgos, uh, thank you for your visit and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, well, I will begin with two um, citations, one from Hannah Arendt and one from the Provisionary Revolutionary Committee of Kronstadt in 7 March uh, 1921. The first one is, when finally, during the Kronstadt rebellion, the Soviets revolted against the party dictatorship and the incompatibility of the new councils with the party system became manifest, Lenin decided almost at once to crush the councils since they threatened the power monopoly of the Bolshevik party. The name Soviet Union for post-revolutionary Russia has been a lie ever since. And the other citation. Under the fire of the cannons, among the explosions of the shells of the Bolsheviks, these enemies of the working people, we, the people of Kronstadt, sent a uh, brotherly salute uh, to all the workers of the world. The red revolted Kronstadt, uh, um, heading towards freedom, hails you. Our enemies will soon know that we are invincible. Okay, so let's start. Austin noticed something simple and revolutionary. Language does not always describe it sometimes acts. In this case, it is not true or false, but effective or not. This is its performative function. Arendt pointed out something sim as simple as revolutionary as uh, uh, Austin, I think. It was the familiar but not known thing that, um, uh, well, when we act, um, uh, what we do is th at the service of an end, a purpose, a goal. But we knew already as well that we can as well act sometimes uh, in a free way. This means that what we do is not at the service of an end. This is the case of politics. It is not a problem-solving procedure, but a realization of our freedom. When we give a name to somebody, to take the first example of Austin. We don't give him his true name, we create his name. By the same token, when we discuss about politics, we are not right, we express ourselves and form our opinions. These two conceptual innovations have a next post facto structure. They refer to creative acts and before something is created, it doesn't exist. Indeed, it is only after being baptized that I know what my name is. And it is after having expressed myself and having discussed with others that I know exactly what my opinion is. It is only at this point that I found out what I wanted to say, in a way. We can say that for Arendt, politics is, in general, a deliberation between equals about the common interests in which the discussing parties don't know beforehand who they are and what they want, because they will learn this during the deliberation through their own words and actions. This concept of politics hasn't yet developed all its consequences, and this is why Arendt's political position, as the idea of a parliamentary system based on councils and not on parties, as she describes it, remains unclear. Party politics is a problem-solving system. One party proposes one solution, another party another solution. No party confesses that it do he do doesn't know beforehand what it really wants. In believing they do, they fell victims of inversions and perversions of their intentions. Whereas councils, being deliberative institutions, help us change our minds, pardon, 
and give us the possibility to find out what we want. So, every philosopher redefines the words we use in his own way. Arendt is no exception. She redefines politics, society, and councils in her own way. The ex post facto element of deliberation was present in the description of actions we call political, but not in all of them. Arendt reversed this description in a definition so that from now on, state functions of a non-deliberative nature, technical functions, are not considered political anymore. These functions are often violent, like the power of masters or slaves or of the few of the many, upon the many. These features are present in society. Here, economic process is at the service of an external end, survival. Hence, when politics is not distinguished from society, action is falsified, um, uh, for it is understood in terms of survival as something necessary, not as something that we want. This threatens freedom, according to Arendt, which is realized exclusively through actions. This point of view is related to Hegel's opinion that it is dangerous for freedom not to distinguish the state, an institution that relies entirely upon the will, from the society of private persons, which is ruled by the necessity of survival. This position is alien to anarchists and Marxists who want at least in the 19th century, to dissolve the state in favor of the society and dissolve politics in favor of the administration of things, an expression of Engels. From now on, Aaron thinks, on the contrary, that institutions like councils of uh, citizens, of workers, etc., that involve deliberation are political. The point of view this point of view, however, is alien to Hegel and close to the position of anarchists and Marxists. For Arendt, the goals of society, especially economic, are illiberal in nature. Th thus, if politics gives its allegiance to these goals, we don't have socialism, as she says, but state capitalism or state socialism, um, which are in her eyes, similar regimes, subjected to the logic of violence, of violence. Thus, it is natural that councils which realize human freedom do not belong to society, but to politics. It is in politics that a, a dialogical concept of power can have its chance. The dialogical concept of power is uh, an expression of Habermas that he uses uh, when commenting Hannah Arendt. Thus, Arendt is situated somewhere between Hegel, anarchist, and Marxist, as we shall see, and the problem is, how is that possible? <laughs> Anarchists and Marxists are against the state and against politics. In which sense can Arendt be on the side of the councils while being against society. If we accept her own definition of politics, cons then councils are compatible with it, and they aren't opposed to the state. This, I think, explains why she speaks so positively of Rosa Luxemburg, a Marxist that did not aim at the substitution of the state by the councils, like other Marxists and like anarchists, but supported the idea of a parliamentary system based on councils like Arendt herself will do. In what follows, I reconstruct in part this idea of Arendt by reconsidering the context of Arendt's positions. In order to do this, I try to read her in reference to the anarchist and Marxist council tradition to which Luxembourg belongs, and Thereafter, 
I read uh, in relation to the thought of Hegel. These two directions have a common goal, to investigate how councils and society are related to each other. Of course, Arendt discusses consciously with Luxembourg, not with Hegel. But this doesn't mean she should not be confronted to him, since she reproduces many of his ideas, even without knowing it, I suppose. Um, many modern political traditions that began their career in the 19th century reject the state and politics. Marx expresses a relatively common opinion when he stresses that society is the subject and the state the predicate of this subject, that economy is the basis and the state is the superstructure, and thus that the state cannot improve the society by intervening in the economy because the state is deprived of any autonomy towards society. Arendt disagrees on that. She says, the state is not a superstructure, and therefore, the separation of state power and economical power for the sake of freedom is something feasible for her. The state can protect freedom. Her intention is not to protect freedom from the state, like the liberals do, but by means of the state. Ant and the liberals are not just opposed on the issue of the direction of protection, what is to be protected from what. Like, like Marx, liberals think that the state cannot control the economy. Arendt think it can. It can, but maybe it shouldn't. That's all the problem. For most of new political traditions, society is more powerful than the state and at the same time, freedom is more at home in society than in the state. If the anarchists are radically against the state, the liberals don't allow it to be much more than an arbiter, and the Marxists endow it with the pro provisional role of he he leading the passage to the classless society where the state will disappear. In this context, anyone thinking like Arendt that the state, or the republic, as she says too, is an essential institution for freedom seems to be some kind of a fossil belonging to a former era. On the other hand, anarchists think that councils are the adequate organization mode for a free society that will consist as Guillaume, an anarchist, said, in an immense federative web of small, direct democracies. Marxists have the same ideal, but they let it happen later in the future, when there will be no classes, after the transitional dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, until then, they tend to diminish the power of the councils and to increase the power of the state. According to Bakunin, if Marxists win, the provisional statal stage will become permanent. It will turn into the permanent domination of a class of specialists. Some people think this is what really happened in Russia. This was the case of the Marxist Karl Korsch, of the anarchist Malatesta, and of Arendt herself. Arendt thinks that the councils wish to play a political rather than a managerial role since their members want to be free, that is, to participate in common affairs, willingly leaving the technical, economical uh, 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 issues to specialists. According to her analysis, this is precisely what happened in 1956 in Hungary when the new councils stood up against the so-called Soviet Union. So it was called Soviet Union, but she said she, it was a lie, that's why I said so-called. <laughs> this means that she solves the problem of the transition to a free society following the model of the anarchists, that is, by constituting councils right away. But Arendt changes the definition of politics and therefore the definition of political space and of the role of the councils. 
I quote, workers and peasants want above all freedom. This is not a quote from uh, uh, Arendt. Uh, it's, it's a quote from an anarchist, Berkman, but it is very close to what the kind of things Arendt says. He is referring to the Kronstadt uh, revolt. Uh, workers and peasants want above all freedom. They don't want to obey to the commandments of the Bolsheviks, uh, uh, as he writes. This is precisely what Arendt claims when she opposes councils to parties. The anarchist Leval uh, wrote in Moscow in 1921, uh, we thought this revolution would emancipate humanity, but unfortunately, um, it is one of the greatest threats against the future of humanity. How did such a dramatical change happen? Arendt intends to solve this puzzle through her idea that councils don't want administrative, economic, social power, but political power, as she sees it. In front of the experience of the Commune of Paris, Karl Marx came closer to the anarchists. He came to the conclusion that the dictatorship of the uh, proletariat should already consist in a federation of councils, because it was the model proposed by the commune. This change astonishes Karl Korsch. He writes, Marx and Engels loved the centralized system of the bourgeois revolutionary dictatorship that was adopted by the convention, the convention, in 1792-95, but then eventually thought that the political form of the proletarian revolutionary dictatorship was the obviously completely opposed system of the commune. Kors doesn't think Marx really changed his mind. Arendt does not believe that either. These ideas are opposed to all Marx's and Lenin's theories, uh, according to her. Nonetheless, we could say that Marx comes closer to the anarchist after 1871, independently of the fact that he expels Bakunin from the International in one year later, and that <laughs> um, this uh, same convergence appears in Lenin's The State and Revolution in 1917, as Arendt underlines, independently of the fact that Lenin deprives the councils of their power, especially after Kronstadt. Marx, who criticized already in 1845 the divide of society in educators and educated, um, uh, would probably not agree with Kautsky and Lenin, who uh, both thought that workers have to be educated by the party independently of the fact uh, that Bakunin accused them of him, Marx, of believing just this. This, in turn, means he didn't consider the identity of the governing party as more important than the structure of the power. Among Marxists, there were exceptions. In Germany, council communism dominates on the left side of social democracy in 1918, <coughs> Um, when Arendt's mother was telling her that the revolt, partially initiated by Luxembourg, was a historic of historical <coughs> importance, because she was a young girl at the time, the left wing of SPD, while Luxembourg and Lip with Luxembourg and Liebknecht, and the left wing radicals with Pannekoek, um, uh, um, an, uh, ho ho an, a, um, a revolutionary that w lived in Germany but came from. Holland, um, will found the Communist Party in 1980. In 1921, it will be taken over by the Leninists, then the radicals accused of infantile obsession with the <coughs> principles by Lenin one year before, in a well-known book, will found another party, the Worker Communist Party, who belonged to what we now call Council Communism. Nonetheless, while the influence of Rosa Luxemburg on Arendt is clearly expressed in her texts, 
the influence of the anti-Bolshevik Marxists who will endorse Luxembourg's criticism of Lenin is only probable. It is probable, in my opinion, that Arendt um, is less discussing with political philosophers living in the USA during and after the war than with German council Marxists inspired by Luxembourg, just like Arendt herself. This idea becomes more convincing if we take into account how these non-Leninist Marxists defend the council and criticize the USSR. They think the Bolsheviks turned the land into a factory, a great factory with the government in the role of the CEO. And they present the councils as the new, fo the new form of governance that does not rule through violence anymore. They give the name totalitarianism to Stalinism as well as to Nazism. Their position about existing socialism is, in a word, the same as the anarchists. They don't think it is half socialist, like Trotskyist, for example. They think it is anti-socialist because it suppresses individual freedom. I refer to Korsh, Panakuk, and Paul Matic uh, as uh, council uh, Marxists. Um, all these positions are to be found in Arendt. When she criticized the state as a big family, which is very close to a big factory in her mind, when she opposes authority and violence, when she speaks of the councils as the new form of governance, and when she rejects Nazism and Stalinism as two forms of totalitarianism. Such positions are not unexpected in somebody that think, thinks under the influence of Rosa Luxemburg, as such council Marxists and aren't, of course, the thesis about totalitarianism is common to this group of radical communists and to the enemies of socialism, but the latter, the latter obviously don't agree with the first on councils, as Arendt does. The Israeli Shmuel Lederman is right, I think, to write in 2019 that Arendt's political theory owes much more to the radical socialist tradition of the 20th century than most of the comment commentators are willing to admit. Her thought has common ideas with anarchism, with the much discussed in the 70s idea of self-management, and James Muldoon, an Englishman, is right to, too when he stresses that Arendt's pr principal reference uh, for the council is nonetheless a revolution where anarchists did not have the final role, the first role, that is the Russian and or the German revolution, about which two interpretations of Marxism, the Bolshevik and the council oriented, were in conflict. If Marxists like Hobsbawm, the well-known historian, um, are not happy with Arndt's discourse on totalitarianism, this is a fact that has much more to do with the opposition of capitalism and socialism than with internal um, to the socialists' opposition between Bolsheviks and their adversaries. Mutatis mutandis, this is valid for many anti-Marxist friends of Arendt as well, but it is wrong to think in a Cold War fashion that an enemy of existing socialism is a friend of capitalism, as both of them do. These adversaries um, and these friends of Arendt fail to see not only that Arendt takes clear position against capitalism, that she criticized the collaboration of capitalism with the Nazis, the capitalists with Nazis, against the working class, the only class, according to her, not be have become Nazi. They don't see either that her criticism of totalitarianism and state socialism probably echoes a th thesis of the council socialists. The fact that when she speaks of totalitarianism, she does not mean the oppression of the private by the public, as it is usually the case, favors, as it were, the proposed interpretation. Free enterprise didn't 
protect Germany from Nazism, the reduction of free enterprise did not reduce democracy, for example, in Sweden. Okay. The liberal idea that freedom of the private person is more important than the freedom of the citizen, uh, that it is the condition for the existence of the latter, as Constant in 19th century and Hayek in 20th century argued, respectively, has not been validated by the facts. For Arendt, political freedom by the social states, no matter if they are called socialist or capitalist, uh, sorry, for Arendt, political freedom is protected by the social states, no matter if they are called socialist or capitalist, because what protects us in non-totalitarian states is not capitalism, but a state capable of opposing to capitalism. Uh, by itself, the she, she writes, the private initiative of capitalism leads everywhere to unhappiness and mass poverty. This is very difficult to say she's right wing from that point of view, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, those supposing supporting state socialism were inspired by the statist Hegel currently considered as, at that time as a forerunner of Bismarck. His thought has nonetheless similarities with Arendt's concerning the relation between society, especially economy, and politics. These similarities concern the justification of the social state and some other issues on which uh, she disagrees with the anti-Bolshevik leftists. Indeed, both think that the political sphere offers us real freedom, both, I mean, Arendt and Hegel, and that society doesn't. On the other hand, her negative stance against society is connected with her turn towards councils that is completely alien to Hegel. <laughs> um, in some, Arendt's thought has something in common both with statist and anti-statist uh, theory, uh, but this is not contradictory from her point of view. This should not be the only occasion where she is consistent, but seems to contradict herself. The same thing happens when she, uh, mm, uh, when she adopts an anarchist position while rejecting the anarchists themselves. According to her, Proudhon and Bakunin were aware of the importance of the council system, but they lacked the intellectual resources in order to understand that this very uh, fact meant that the revolution does not lead to the destruction of the state and uh, the government, but on the contrary, to the construction of a new state and a new form of government. The new form of governance is the councils. Councils are a new type of political organization, a new form of governance. On the other hand, when the non-Marxist aren't thinks that Marx is not responsible for Stalin, when she thinks that Luxembourg's Marxist thought should be taught in all political science departments, when she um, um, is seen as an enemy of freedom by some liberals, she remains consistent while she is following her idea that totalitarianism is an extension of capitalist imperialism. That's the main thesis of a, of a big book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. The underlying convictions of which have been exposed by Hobbes, who is, according to Arendt, the philosopher of the bourgeoisie, while councils, praised by Marx, among others, are the most effective protection against totalitarianism and capitalist imperialism. When we realize that, according to um, her new uh, definition of politics, uh, Arendt doesn't intend to diminish the importance of politics in relation to society like anarchists, and um, 
in a lesser degree, liberals and Marxists do, but to affirm the primacy of politics in relation to uh, uh, society and economy, like Hegel and the social democrats, everything begins to make sense, I think, I hope. A specific political organization ought to protect us from the distress due to the social system which is ruled by the capitalist economy. And councils are the most important part of this political organization. Arndt disagrees with the uh, denial of politics, while she agrees with Luxembourg, who wants to have councils and the state, considering that councils and an elected parliament are both necessary for the realization of our freedom. For Agnes Heller, a uh, Marxist philosopher and uh, a scholar, of, um, uh, a pupil of uh, Lukács, um, Arndt understood that Luxembourg disagreed with the dissolution of the Constitutive Assembly by the Bolsheviks because representation was an impo as important as the councils in her eyes. This is why Arndt demands universal vote, not only workers' vote, free elections, not only party elections, the liberty of the press, against Bolsheviks, who, in theory, defend the power of the councils and end up, in fact, with the dictatorship of the party elite. It was already the criticism of Luxembourg. Okay. Instead of the dilemma, parliament or councils, Arendt sets the dilemma, parliament and councils, or party dictatorship. And this is all quite close to what happened once here, I mean, in Yugoslavia, I think. Um, Arendt's political position could be defined as a political anarchism. It is a kind of anarchism in the sense that the, um, she abhors party politics and supports council democracy against fascism, liberalism, and social democracy. She even wants to have councils right away, disagreeing in that which, with Leninist Marxism, mm, though probably not with Marx himself. But anarchists reject politics while Arendt refuses to imprison councils in society, for example, by reducing them to workers' council and extends them, on the contrary, to everybody, no matter what their class is, as it was the case in the councils of the American and the French Revolution. She disagrees with anarchists on the crucial point of the uh, definition of society and politics. Councils do not belong to society, they are part of the political sphere. Furthermore, she thinks that councils should determine politics and not get involved in economic issues. Her anarchism is thus a political kind, of a political kind. The council is not a part of society, but of politics, which extends to everyone, and this extended to all citizens' power is the new form of the state. Hers in is a non-anti-statist anarchism, if that, that has a meaning, I don't know, <laughs> because she identifies the state with her new definition of politics. Um, this view of politics presupposes that the state is not beyond, that it doesn't look down to its members as objects of its action, but that's the subjects of uh, its action. Um, so the new concept of politics, politics defined as a form of activity, brings about a new concept of state. If we call state or republic the topos of political praxis, in our sense, a sense that is um, incarnated by councils, then anarchism could cease to be anti-statist, and then, perhaps, uh, could we speak of state anarchism, or as Bruce Smith, uh, a scholar, has done in 2019, of anarcho-republicanism, which is more or less the same, uh, in Arendt. Now, after circumscribing Arendt's political position, we are left with one question. How does she mean the distinction of social and political that she is using. Society is a threat to freedom, according to Arendt. What does this mean? Society is the name for uh, the playground of economy, economy 
when in modernity economy leaves the oikos, the family, the household. Uh, she uses the same word for high society and other modern phenomena, but all these meanings are related to the first one. If Arendt wants to separate politics from society, it is because she wants to separate politics from economy. Her liberal readers do not understand that, do not understand that she wants, doesn't want to protect the economy from the state, or they don't understand why. Margaret Canovan, a very well-known uh, uh, Arendt scholar, does not accept Arendt's position in favor of the councils. And she is sorry because Arendt didn't live long enough to see the turn of the world economical poli politics away from Keynes model and its reorientation towards Hayek's model. By comparing Arendt to Hegel, a thinker that defines society already as the specific and distinct playground of the economy, ruled by vit vital needs and uh, consequently by necessity, um, a thinker that already separated the state from society so as to protect the state should help us understand at what Arendt a aims, because to begin with, she brings us away, it, it, Hegel brings us away from liberal presuppositions. Of course, Hegel and Arendt are completely different at first sight. Hegel says the state um, should intervene in the economy and Arendt says it shouldn't. If Hegel was the philosopher of the French Revolution that intervened in the economy, Arendt could have been the philosopher of the American one. Okay. Let's see a little bit this point. The difference is not that the French Revolution failed. Arendt thinks that the American Revolution failed too because its council organization and its ethos were lost. The difference here is that Hegel justifies the period of terror as the first step towards freedom, whereas Arendt doesn't, and that there has been such a period in France and not in America. On the other hand, as soon as we focus on this difference, its aspect changes. Arendt doesn't condemn what she calls the despotism of freedom. This is the point where, she, where everybody, almost all commentators read her in a strange way for me. She doesn't condemn the despotism of freedom. She does not dismiss the recourse to the dictatorship for the sake of the foundation of freedom, as she says, as something absurd. She agrees with Hegel so far. She condemns the law of suspects, but so does Hegel too. He condemns such a fanaticism. Arendt's argument against terror is that it does not just address a political threat against freedom, but first of all, an economical threat against life. Persecutions on the basis of uh, suspicion are usually explained as a war against the hypocrisy of monarchists. At the time, okay, Arndt disagrees. In order to save the Republic, a dictatorship was required, but there was no need to persecute political opinions. She does not say that tyranny is not a means compatible with democracy as an end. Uh, following other enemies of the Jacobins. She condemns the persecution of mere intentions and thinks the political will to help the poor is responsible for this persecution. The social question becomes a political purpose in terms of compassion, that is, as something obvious, beyond the liberation, and therefore capable of violent consequences. consequences. This criticism does not mean that Arendt is against social solidarity, as Rovaud d'Alon has convincingly shown. Paul Matic, a council Marxist, criticized at the same period the political use of compassion with similar intentions. Arendt concludes 
includes in that it is, no, concludes maybe, it is dangerous to, for politics to determine economical topics as political goals. She does not think that the intervention of politics in the economy is necessarily pointless. She does not condemn this intervention because politics could never control economy. Following the liberal and Marxist, in theory, opinion, even if uh, she believes that politics cannot uh, take so much control of the economy as to make poverty vanish. She does not close the door to the Hegelian and social democratic option, but she does think that the politics that claims to lead the economy, even if she cannot do it, is dangerous for freedom. The solution of the social question is a condition of the extension of political freedom, but politics cannot address this condition of its own free exercise without reducing dangerously political freedom. Bizarre, okay. But I think there is a way out um, that makes things... Um, we can disagree with Arndt, but, but we have to understand what she's trying to say. Arndt's idea that the pointless violence of terror was due to the fact that Robespierre gave more weight to the question of poverty than to the issue of freedom does not agree with Hegel's more positive interpretation. Both interpretations have nonetheless a common framework. Both claim that politics should be protected from economy for freedom needs protection against necessity. Their disagreement it lies in the fact that Hegel thinks economy should be controlled by politics without endangering freedom, while Arendt estimates that it, this, should, this would threaten the latter. In her case, there are two alternatives. Either we let the poor unhelped, or we find a non-political way of sublating po poverty, a way to intervene that would not consist in a political goal. And I think Arendt has something like this in mind. Parties follow political goals. Councils don't. They just structurally subordinate the interest of the member of the, to the collectivity. Their very existence introduces a new way of regulating the relations between economy and politics. It appears then as natural that Arendt wishes to put the councils at the place of the parties. Since revolution interrupts the continuity of legal order, even the revolutionary introduction of such rational order is unjustified for Kant. If the revolution uh, cannot win unless scaffolds are erected in every square, then Malatesta prefers defeat. The critique of violence thinks that freedom cannot be realized through the destruction of freedom. Things are different in Hegel and in Arendt as well. Hegel legitimizes violence because the law cannot be imposed without uh, using fear. Robespierre was like Pesistratus for Hegel, a tyrant who prepared the city for democracy by removing aristocrats from power. By the same token, because the particular interests of the nobles have dismantled Germany uh, um, as a state, Hegel wishes that somebody will come and exert violence against them, as Robespierre did in France. Um, uh, 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 according to Shlomo Avineri, this is close to the meaning Marx gives to the dictatorship of the proletariat. I would like to say that this explains perhaps why Marx identifies eventually the dictatorship of the proletariat with the councils, because councils structurally forbid privileges. The young Hegel, an aristocratic enemy of plutocracy like Plato, agreed with Plato in thinking that only those who sacrifice themselves for the community should be citizens. Um, and that the economy should be left to private persons that should not be citizens. In the <coughs> first works of Arendt, 
there are passages which she appears to be as archaic as the young Hegel, especially when she justifies slavery. They have been collected by Sheldon Wallin in order to show that she wasn't a Democrat at first and that she became a Democrat when writing on revolution. I believe it is right to say that she changed her mind, just like Hegel. When Hegel recognized that everyone should be free, um, he asked himself how political freedom could survive when everyone is a citizen as well as a bourgeois, when freedom and necessity apply to the same persons. In his maturity, Hegel accuses Plato of suppressing the freedom of the individual. Plato defined uh, freedom uh, as a class privilege because he doesn't know that man is free as man. When Hegel dismisses the divide between free citizens and unfree private persons, um, he acknowledges that we must all be both private persons and citoyens. Freedom uh, uh, still requires the separation of state and society, but now the same individuals must be internally divided in citizen and bourgeois. Modernity raises that this question, not only because we are now supposed to be all free, but, uh, because, but above all because it sees the emergence of a sphere that is at the same time public and private. For Hegel, as for Arendt, the ancients knew only two forms of organization, family and state, but now there exists a th third one, civil society, the curiously hybrid realm, as Arendt says, and she calls it simply society. The name of the science that studies society is political economy. It contains family, economy, oikos, and the state, political polis. So this name seemed contradictory as long as there existed nothing between oikos and polis, as Aaron says. He, it is in this framework, I think, that the common ideas of Hegel and Arendt have their meaning. The fact that Arendt does not know she is following Hegel on this offers a kind of validation of their common positions and helps us understand Arendt's underlying logic. Like Hegel, she wants to separate economy from politics, but she eventually rejects the ancient solution of slavery, according to which uh, someone uh, um, um, lives under the coercion uh, of survival so that someone else can enjoy political freedom. This separation of economy from politics when everybody is free can happen though only if the private person and the citizen are not separated as persons into two classes but as two activities inside the same individual. The question of how to separate the two qualities under conditions of universal freedom can be resolved by distinguishing types of individual activity. And this exactly is uh, the way Arendt defines politics and economy. Politics is action. The Aristotelian word is praxis. Economy is const construction or production, poiesis in Aristotle. On this point, she seems to complete Hegel's argument, since public and private uh, uh, correspond to, activi to activity types, it is easy to distinguish, for example, the private production of goods from the public space, private poverty and political activity, the care for prosperity and political virtue. Social problems exist and they concern us as political beings, since they are not automatically solved through competition. The gap between rich and poor is a legitimate cause of scandal for Hegel and for Arendt. Arendt even speaks of social injustice. The, this means that freedom needs to be protected against, against this. For Hegel, this requires not only the division of labor, a form of interdependence, uh, uh, but institution against competition as well, like corporations that help the poor from the inside of society. As, as Hegel says, every human being has a right to demand a livelihood from society. 
social institutions should be should bring the social maelstrom of individual interests into under their control. Hegel shields the state or the republic, the sphere where individuals act as citizens and not as family members or private persons, from the intervention into economic topics, because he thinks that this work belongs to the civil society which constitutes the external state, as he, say, as he says. He means a non-political state, I think. A similar, unusual delimitation of politics and society occurs in Arendt. No political positioning of hers has provoked such negative uh, reactions, even among her closest collaborators, as did her position against the intervention of politics in economy. Okay, her book on Eichmann uh, provoked even more negative reactions, but not because of some theoretical opinion. Okay, since Arendt uh, defines economy and politics as two kinds of activity, we can consequently say that she excludes the possibility that a political action could aim at the resolution of the social question, which according to her concerns mostly technical issues about construction and production without ceasing to be a political action. The good thing about this treatment of the question is that it saves the meaning of politics after Kronstadt. If um, problem solving is an activity for suitable for the uh, uh, unequal social realm and not for the political one where everyone is equal with everyone, then we can understand why a party that wants to destroy economic inequality reproduces the inequality it is supposed to fight when it conquers political power, which is the great problem she tries to solve in her book uh, about revolution. When the state is reduced to an instrument in the hands of the bourgeois, to an instrument uh, 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 in to an instrument of their particular interests, then, for Arendt, as for Hegel, freedom disappears. This is how Arendt defines corruption. This is how she describes bourgeois mentality in general. And this is, again, how she understands imperialism. On the other hand, the intention to solve the social question by political means is, for Arendt, another way to bring politics under the domination of economy. Why? Couldn't we object that, in this case, our purpose is not to impose particular interests on politics, but to protect freedom from the dangerous consequences of particular interests? Yes, but this is just a purpose, and that is probably the problem for Arendt. For her, when I act politically, I only learn afterwards what it is exactly that I want. Robespierre uh, tur um, turned to the urgent needs of the people. The despotism, and when he did that, according to Arendt, the despotism of freedom had ended, she writes, the transformation of the rights of man into the rights of sans culotte was the turning point, not only of the French Revolution, but of all revolutions that uh, were to follow. But this is, did not happen because Robespierre had a bad purpose. S since in On Revolution, Robespierre is another name for Lenin, it comes as no surprise that Luxembourg had already criticized Lenin in the, name, in the same manner. His intentions when he dissolved the power of the councils were certainly not bad although the consequences of this act were more than problematic. We have uh, terror when the independent constitution of the political is abandoned, according to Arendt, in favor of the social question because the non-distinction between public and private destroys the independency of politics which, while conserving its instrumentalization. Arendt Arendt's argument seems to be the following. Since we can't save the republic from the interests of the rich 
by submitting it to the interest of the poor, we still can change the st its structures. By making the political independent, we do not just reverse the direction of the instrumentalization, we are making instrumentalization impossible. Uh, following an argument we find in Aristotle, we could say democracy is the regime of the poor, not because they take the place of the aristocrats who put the republic at the service of their interests, but because when the many ruled, then they ruled because they are free, not because they are rich, which means that they rule thanks to the form of the regime and not because their party has won. Politics can support uh, politics can support economical goals that are expected to favor freedom. This is a socialist stance. The independence of politics may have economical consequences that will benefit freedom. This seems to be Arendt's stance. In the first case, um, politics is at the service of external purposes, so it is not a praxis anymore. In the second case, Politics is an end in itself and a praxis. This, I think, is the role of the Council in Arendt. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yorgos, for this, oh. <laughs> for this lecture. So, who has questions? I do. Um, well, first, uh, well, I think well, you very convincingly showed how there is a parallel w uh, between Arendt and Hegel in their positioning, somewhat skeptical positioning towards society yes. in uh, favor of the state. And in both cases, in more contemporary vocabulary, we would, what they term a society, we would actually uh, today name economy. What I find curious is this, is this uh, shift uh, in between the words society economy and while for Hegel that's easily understandable because there was just not that meaning of economy available yet and so he did I mean there are many reasons why the he used the term uh, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft is this is less clear in Arendt why did she use society as why, why did she substitute uh, yes why, why did not she she criticize economy uh, I, what did, what did, why did she not speak about the dichotomy of economy and the state and instead chose state, um, uh, society and the state as, her, as the name of dichotomy? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Um, um, there's a, a wonderful book of, of, um, called The Attack of the Blob. Well, now I can't remember the name because I have, I'm not very good in, uh, in remembering names but I will uh, remember it uh, along the way. Um, uh, I'm a, uh, an American uh, woman. Um, she has called the book The Attack of the Blob because uh, Arendt um, sees society, seems to see society as something um, extraterrestrial that has come and attacked uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the Earth. It's the name of a film of the 50s. It, it, it's an extraterrestrial thing that comes <laughs> to blob. Uh, um, this is the idea we get when we read the first things she writes about society. Because she comes, she, um, I, 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 it's an interest, interesting thing. She, as she said, and I think she, she's sincere, she didn't want to study political philosophy. She wanted to study ancient Greek poetry and metaphysics. Mm -hmm. But then, as she said, she was a Jew, a German Jew. It was very difficult not to be interested in politics <laughs> in the 30s. <laughs> um, and that means it, there are things she doesn't know. Mm -hmm. She begins to think about politics with Aristotle. Mm -hmm. In Aristotle, there's no place for this thing between Oikos and Polis. Mm -hmm. That's why she tries to make something about it. And, and the interesting thing that is, in a way, a validation of what Hegel says is that without knowing Hegel, in my opinion, mm -hmm. she arrives to very, very similar uh, ideas about it. Uh, uh, Precisely because she was a bit 
uh, not very up to date with the theory, and so she used the same yes, starting yes. point as Hegel and then uh, made uh, more or less the same. Someone who has not all uh, the information that uh, the others have can come up with something more interesting because, I mean, the, the, uh, sometimes uh, uh, to, to know less than the others gives you more freedom to, to think. I mean, uh, this is not a criticism of Arendt. I mean, she really um, was sincere when she said that. It, it was not her main topic. She hasn't studied all her life political philosophy, um, uh, not at all, in a way. Uh, uh, so, on the other hand, this particular idea that everything that is, in a way, social um, lacks the possibility to be free, um, I think catches something that is real in, in, the, in, the, in the real world, uh, beyond Hegel and Arendt, etc. And um, uh, what I tried just in the end is, okay, the problem when she says abruptly that we should not um, put forward uh, 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 economical subjects in politics, mm -hmm. well, everybody was upset. Even her uh, best friend uh, in America, uh, Mary McCarthy, she asked, well, what will we discuss then in politics? About gardens? <laughs> 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 uh, but I, I, I tried to understand and to, to, to put it under a certain perspective. And the idea is, I think her idea is that if you organize society in a council way, in the way, as, in, in the way of the uh, workers and citizen councils, then you have, in a way, in your system, mm -hmm. the social uh, question. Uh, it is the structure of the system to take care of the, of the social system. Okay, but uh, now I just thought, but maybe there is there is a bit of a difference here between Hegel and Arendt, the, in the sense that wouldn't Hegel actually ask exactly the same question as her American friend? I mean, what would we discuss? What what do we discuss in politics in Hegel? I think in the, well, his kind of system of councils, it's precisely well, work. It's it's about it's about economy. It's uh, I mean, it's not. It's it has to the, the the political engagement must be about something determinate, something that we occupy and also very grounded. Um, I'm not uh, satisfied e either with Hegel or with Arendt on mm -hmm. that point. Okay, <laughs> Hegel. Uh, has no council system. And yes. I mean, uh, he wants yeah. to protect st the state from the economy, but, well, the state is not such a free institution. Uh, that <laughs> okay. Uh, on the other hand, um, what, um, what uh, uh, the, the problems with Arendt are, of course, that she mm -hmm. tries to exclude from everything that political is political, the economy, but the other hand, on the other hand, her definition of politics of what Hegel calls the state, which is um, equals discussing together about their common interests. Mm -hmm. And in a way uh, that everything that has this shape is political, and everything that does not have this shape is not political. I mean, absolute monarchy is not political, for example, uh, according to this definition. But um, a small village in, uh, in Russia, in uh, 19th century that has a mir and then discuss together what they will do for their productions. They have do, done something political. That I find interesting. Mm -hmm. And all the, the, um, the idea against uh, the, the anarchists when they, she says councils are very good, but this is the new state. This is a state. This is a form of political power. I think she's right. Mm -hmm. The state is not an, um, uh, something as, as an a uh, wooden idol, uh, a fetish uh, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can accept as it is or destroy, you can change it. Mm -hmm. okay. first, uh, first, thank you uh, for the lecture. I'm not uh, far from that. Uh, an expert on Arendt, and I'm a bit ashamed of it because I so, so often stumble upon her without actually knowing her. Uh, and then, w when you describe it, describe uh, when you described it, uh, 
I was astonished to hear that she wasn't very well read in Hegel. To me, everything that I know from Arendt is deeply Hegelian, even, yes, th this is astonishing. That, that, that is new to me because I always... Uh, uh, you don't find references, I, I don't, yes. Because, you know, there is a sentence in Arendt when she says the basic right is to have rights. And this is a direct quotation from a lecture from Hegel. And this is why I, I, I cannot simply accept the idea that she didn't, that she wasn't familiar with uh, his text. It's the same, Maybe okay. She, was, she, she want, don't, didn't want to pay her uh, debts, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is, it's the same, it's the same relation as, uh, for instance, Sartre and Fichte, because here, there are the same formulation, the same argumentation, uh, that it's so close that it's virtually impossible that uh, he, sh he wasn't, in a way, uh, affected, influenced by him. And I would say that the same uh, holds true for, for Arendt. I, again, this is a pure speculation, but they are so close in the mindset, in the way they uh, develop their argument, that I simply refuse to believe, let us say. <laughs> Uh, but okay, my question would be, uh, since um, you describe their respective position as both want to um, uh, defend the state, the political, from the society, the economical, wh uh, whereas uh, Arendt, uh, Hegel want the state to intervene into the economy, whereas uh, uh, Arendt uh, doesn't want that uh, uh, the state does economical things, intervene into economy. But uh, that means that she must have had a certain theory about how economy functions. Because to me, it's impossible that economy would run smoothly if you're not you know, the protagonist of the uh, natural free market that uh, regulates itself by itself. So uh, the, the economy is in internally conflicting. And this is why it needs an external uh, regulation, um, direction, uh, setting this uh, framework, which can, uh, can be only uh, done in the political way. So I think that conceptually, uh, the state, uh, the, the economy, society needs calls, uh, calls for state. So what kind of theory of the working, of the fun functioning of society is our economy is implied by pro uh, preventing the state from intervening into economy? That would be my first question. The, se the second would be rather Hegelian one, again, since you mentioned it, uh, since you mentioned that uh, at first uh, Hegel adopted basically platonic view that not all are um, part of the political so uh, political state, that uh, some are not citizens, uh, have a security, but for that uh, reason uh, uh, practice economy, uh, but for that uh, reason are excluded from political life. He speaks about politician nullitate. And then at certain point, this idea vanishes, gets lost. Why? This is purely Hegelian, uh, according to you. I know that uh, you wrote the thesis on individuality. It has to do something with the, the uh, status of the subject. But I would just, just of curiosity, uh, like to hear your position, because I'm sure you have one. Thank you. For, as for the first question, now, um, uh, I. Uh, to say, in fact, we have to reconstruct her position in, a, in, in part because there are texts where she said, I have uh, referred to one, when she says that the, the best way to be protected from the economy is social state. And then she speaks of Sweden. Okay. And after, uh, on the other hand, she says the state should not intervene. Well, <laughs> it does intervene in Sweden. Uh, <laughs> I think completely. So, what is the position? I think a way to understand this is the following. She, uh, one, uh, at, at one point, she will use the usual uh, concept of state. At another point, she will use 
her own conceptual of the political. The political, as she sees it, is much more restricted in a way, because it's all that has to do with debil deliberative uh, processes. If we deliberate about our interests, etc., etc., we are making politics, and this is the new form of the state, in a way. Um, but then, when she gives an interview about Sweden, she says the state, and she means the state as we all uh, mean. But from her point of view, I would say all the decisions or the interventions that we call it state interventions are technical interventions for her, and probably she would place the instances that do this intervent these interventions inside society, mm -hmm. as regulative forms of society, as does as Hegel does. I mean, justice or cooperation, but justice too, because. What, uh, when, what is the answer of Hegel to the distinction of powers of Montesquieu? He says, there is one thing he doesn't say, but you find in the structure of the book. He says, justice is independent because it's not the state anyway. It, <laughs> it's outside the state. It's in the, it belongs to the civil society, to external state, etc. Um, yes, but in, in Hegel, this is structural position is that the society is possible only within the state. So the state is the one that, in a political way, constitutes the necessary framework for society to work statelessly. So yes, yes, so, but yes. This is the result of political action, not something, some natural state. And this is then a kind of intervention, nonetheless. In Hegel? No, no. Of course. In Hegel, yes, but it is <laughs> conceptually clear. You, you, where does where does the type of intervention, let's say in Sweden, uh, where is the, the type of intervention is determined? Uh, on the one hand, as in Sweden, on, on the other hand, uh, on, let's say, uh, Chile or, or United States. These are different uh, uh, way of self-regulation of society, what would say. But what decides, decides which way is applied? Not society, but the, the political state. Yes, yes. So but the, the decisions that they, the, the political state are, the, I would say, from, a, uh, from an arranging point of view, as I constructed, the, 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 the truly um, political decisions that the, the political state can take is uh, uh, related to the structure of decision making. How we, not the decisions themselves. The, the state will say, for example, as it did in Yugoslavia, you have your councils. And then you decide about other matters. I mean, okay, from this point, I think it's m much more like this. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, um, it's uh, uh, something a hasard. Uh, uh, it's, comment uh, dire, ce n'est pas un hasard. That she uh, speaks about councils in that period. She it is a period where the well the the where, where in the seventies where the, the 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 model the Yugoslavian model was very very discussed in all over the world anyway, because it it was like the the coming back of an old idea that was put aside. Uh, uh, so when I don't know if I answered, but. I think I have to go to the second question now. Uh, yeah, please do. Uh, um, why Hegel changed his mind? What uh, made him? What, what prompted him? Um, first, where the, I think it appears in 805 in the Real Philosophy 2, or the Jena uh, is the same as the same as which means the text that were published on the 20th century, the, of the lectures he made there. Um, it, it is the same lecture where he, say, where, where he says, where, uh, in the, the passage on Constitution, where he says, um, the same person is bourgeois and citoyen, which is the end of the two, uh, the idea of the two classes. And it's the same text where he, he says good things about Robespierre. What, is, what does Robespierre? He um, imposes through fear um, the equality of, of all the citizens. 
that is the, the law. The law is imposed by force. Um, and it is legitimate to do that because it is, you cannot have a state without this thing. So in a way, from an internal point of view, um, uh, systematic point of view, I would say the utopian platonic first idea uh, ceases to appear as a state. It's not a state, it's two states in a way. It's a master-slave relationship in a way. So it's not a state. There's no notion of law and uh, isonomia, as we say in Greek, <laughs> which means the equality of law for all. Uh, 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 the external uh, thing is, well, in a way, he, um, he, he, he makes a, a leap from uh, antiquity to modernity, then, because he realizes what is happening around him. Uh, you can't have a platonic state, and the idea he will have afterwards is always that Plato uh, just grasped, grasped the, the substance of ancient polis, and it was, all, uh, uh, it was too late already, it was the end of the polis. And I think when he speaks of himself in, 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 in the beginning of the philosophy of right by appealing to uh, the all of Minerva, etc., etc., he compares himself to Plato. He is, uh, in a way, uh, saying what I am describing, but this is another topic, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, something that is maybe declining. But, okay, um, so he, I think the, the, the external necessity is that he sees that uh, what uh, is at stake is the, what he will call the modern uh, uh, principle of subjectivity. Everybody is free. And he, he goes so back as to say uh, um, Socrates is the first one. This has begun with Socrates, this goes through Jesus, through Luther, through Descartes, and now at, at least, at last, it has come uh, to the political level. So I cannot be uh, back, bring it back anyway. On the other hand, it's unjust to have two classes. Sorry, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he became Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this is it. So okay.